Uh, I think when I explain, or let's have a look on this picture, it, on the right-hand corner, there is a this, which means how we see the landscape in equator, and on left side there is a thermal picture. So we see that there are temperatures 70 degrees, and when we look inside the acacia forest, which is on horizon 200 meters away, we have 20 degrees. So we see 70 degrees on sand, and 20 degrees in the acacia forest, because the forest, the trees, they cool. And I, I think this is a whole story, <laughs> that vegetation and water are really able to decrease temperature, and not only, they do environment for us. And during next 20 minutes, I will try to explain that we can understand it in terms of science and in terms of physics. So, fundamental role of water and vegetation in maintaining of local climate. And we will have a look on the amount of solar energy we are getting and how we, this, how we distribute this energy and we will show effect of lands, landscape management. There is a one term which is called solar constant. From the constant distance from sun, there is a amount of energy which is plus minus constant and it's 1,367 watt per square meter. During one year, we are getting different amount because as goes on the ellipse around sunshine. So, 14 of 1412 to 1321 is the amount of energy which goes on outer layer of atmosphere on each square meter during one year. When there is a nice sunny day, about 1000 watt per square meter goes on square, uh, yeah, about 1000 watts comes per square meter which means that 100 hectares, one square kilometer, which is not much, is getting so much energy, like one reactor in our big power station, Temelin. So our big power station, 2,000 megawatts, produces this energy, and this energy goes on two square kilometers. And we people steer this energy. We, by management, decide whether it will be heat or whether it will be life processes, which we cannot listen, which are very silent, but they are there. So this is the same power station from distance, and it produces some energy, 2,000 megawatts, and the area around has about four square kilometers. So during sunshine, it's getting twice more than this big power station is producing. Picture we saw. So you can have dry land, and on dry land, the main energy which goes away is hot air. Or you can have a cultural landscape, forest, which when it is well designed, most of the energy is used for the life processes, and one most important is cooling effect of vegetation, so water vapor. And this is what Willy Ripple was explaining. Here it's uh, uh, illustrated. So we have one liter of water. In order to evaporate one liter of water, we have to add 0.7 kilowatt hours, 2.5 megajoule divided by 3,600. It's 0.7 kilowatt hours. Then water evaporates, we have energy in the water vapor, and water vapor condensates somewhere and releases this energy. What we don't realize is that there is a big change in volume. One liter of water, has, when it evaporates, the water vapor has a volume 1,200 liters. So more than 1,000 times more, and it happens around us. So, 
uh, steam engine works everywhere where there is a vegetation, but it's at temperature 20 degrees, and it happens. But we just don't see it, and we have to respect it. So we can measure it. I just now say some numbers which are supported by the measurement we do. We can measure the amount of incoming solar radiation, amount of reflected solar radiation, infrared radiation, humidity, temperature. And then we can see that if you have a concrete, which is a red uh, curve, then from concrete surface on sunny day, 400, 500 watts would leave the surface in form of hot air. If you have a wet meadow, forest, this 400, 500 watts will be converted into evaporation, which means in latent, in hidden heat. So we don't, cannot measure change of temperature because again, the energy was used for process. I am using, uh, I'm showing this just to show that when we drain one square meter, we change the flux of solar energy in order of magnitude several hundred watts. And this is what we do. So when we do it on several square kilometers, we deal with the energy which we produce in our power stations. We know the order of magnitudes of the solar energy, how it is transformed to primary production, which means how much we can take with the biomass. It's not much, it's less than 1%. We know how much goes through decomposition, through heating, through the evaporation. We cannot measure so-called radiative forcing. Even if we believe it exists, it's unbelievably small what was calculated for next decade, 0.2 watt per square meter. Uh, can you imagine you have income 1,300, which changes during a year, which changes during the sun activities. And we bother with 0.2 watts, which nobody can measure. Then. We are afraid of the amount of the CO2 in the atmosphere, 380, 400. How much water vapor we have in atmosphere? So it's on the axis. It's uh, different, but maybe 1,000, maybe 11,000, maybe sometimes 40,000 ppm. And so if I plot it linearly, here somewhere will be CO2 in, in the second floor will, on the graph. It will be water vapor just fluctuating like this, depending on us what we do in nature. So here is just written what I said. Many things we can observe. There is a fantastic device, thermovision camera. For example, we can take airship, put the thermovision camera on it, and during one day to follow temperatures in a very small, uh, very small sample of our cultural landscape. And you see that wet meadow has a low uh, uh, amplitude, that asphalt has a high amplitude, and here it is, it's midday. So you see that in such a landscape, which is so typical for our countries, you can have 26 degrees water, forest, or the dense vegetation, like older stand, or you can have 50 degrees if it is drained, and it's all. So this is how we control uh, temperature. We just should realize that we do it on place. Uh, then we also change the air temperature, which is so carefully measured by meteorologists. So changes of land cover are linked with marked changes of surface temperature, which are not registered by the standard temperature measurements. But, and now some examples. In Kenya, there was 
removed about 2,000 square kilometers of forest, and it happened from 90, so we can have a look on satellite pictures and see a real effect. We cannot evaluate it in this way for Europe, because it took a long time in former centuries, and we don't have data. So, Mau Forest, 4,000 square kilometers, it feeds 12 rivers, and there was a dramatic deforestation. Why? Because carrying capacity of forest is one, two, three people per square kilometer. And when population grows, it cut forests and transfer it into the agriculture land. It's a process. What happened that Japanese company constructed big water power station and water power station stopped, couldn't work because of low water level or high water level. So Japanese, I think they won, I see Zbigniew here, I think they won and they will got money back from Kenyan government. But Kenyan government didn't provide wrong numbers. They provide numbers from 40s, 60s, 70s, and it changed suddenly. And we, are, we can have a look on the satellite pictures, and this was forest. I have here one witness, we were there together, making film. And it was forest, several years ago. You see still rest of trees. And this is a dam which doesn't work much. And this is the river during expected rain period, but rain period didn't come. And here, on upper part, you see the surface of forest, how it goes down. This is evaluated satellite picture from the years you see, from 86, 2000, 2008. And down there is a thermal picture. And you see thermal scale. So when we then compare the year 86 from 2009, we see where the temperature increased and the temperature increased up to 40 degrees, for example. And it's on places where forest disappeared. Uh, so, when we replace forest by tea, it doesn't work well because tea is still hot. We need really structured vegetation, which cools. And when we again recalculate it or express the heat, produced by the amount of nuclear power stations. So just this 1,800 square kilometers deforestation represents the heat produced by 200, uh, sorry, yes, by about 180 <laughs> nuclear power stations. I'm just saying it, how we affect the climate and then we visited forest and rest of the forests also, and there is a village in 3,000 meter altitudes. We took pictures by thermovision camera. This is my knee, and you see temperature 40 on the deforested places, and you see temperature 20. And when we go inside, sorry, this is deforested part up to 50 degrees. You see 58. This is where just I expose the thermovision camera. When we go inside, there is a 20 degrees, once more. So now we are on the edge of the forest, and we go just 30 meters, not more, and we are in 20 degrees. So when we remove forest, we really <laughs> change temperature and all these things. Uh, we visited there men who works on two hectares. This is very optimistic, what I am say showing now. On 200 he on two hectares, this man, he is a teacher, and he s mm, he stores water in tanks, and he also stores rainwater in the soil. And his trick is that he has uh, several la layers of vegetation. And on these two hectares, it is like Willy shows the China. He said, I, I would be able to feed 60, 80 
people. But what is interesting, that he did it during drought period, which lasted four years. So then we would like to prepare a new edition of Water Paradigm. And I think most important, there are two important chapters. One on water, which is theoretical, but based on physics. And the other one would be positive examples, like this one and like others. So bees, you would pay for bees if, if, it, if it bit you because it will die. Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah. So it's end of dry, drought season. It was four years drought season. We also met people who, after deforestation, who put shrubs or he, they encouraged shrubs in the agriculture land. And in this way, they attracted dew and small rain. Oh, you saw it. And there is a village which said, no, we will not allow to cut 600 hectares of forest because when they did it in these 3,000 meters, they lost afternoon humidity and they got early morning frost and they couldn't produce the vegetables and so on. There is very important thing in the structured vegetation. It's a temperature, uh, vertical temperature distribution. In forest, there is a lower temperature down and higher temperature on crowns. Here it is 30 degrees up on crowns and 22 degrees down. When you see corn, for example, there is up to 50 degrees down, no weeds, and 30 degrees up. What does it mean? That here hot air goes up and it steals water vapor, yes. because it goes up, it disappears, while here only crowns, only trees, not board, not soil, produces water, and they control it and very slowly release water vapor, and water vapor stays there, and then night again condensates, and this is this, and then the water pressure goes down, and we have the effect of sucking. Yeah, this was set. So when I summarize it, we have sun, we have a lot of energy coming on the outer layer of atmosphere, we have a lot of energy coming during sunny day to, up to, to one square meter, we can decide whether it will be used for processes, as we said, and processes is production of plants, processes is life, and it is how we control the climate. Because when we think just only CO2, it's a gas which has about 400 ppm. Methane, almost nothing. But water, vapor, is in atmosphere in order of magnitude 1,000, 40,000. And we decide how much is there. And if we have clouds, we have 100 watts per square meter. If we don't have clouds, we have 1,000 watts per square meter. This is what controls temperature and all, the, all these things. So we have emission trading for CO2, we have emission trading for methane, and we ignore water. Because it's complicated. Uh, this is just to recon how is it with the, with the idea of the uh, greenhouse effect. So on the left hand side, there is a short wave radiation of sunshine because it's at 6,000 Kelvin. The sunshine goes through glass and then hot air cannot go up and partly long uh, radiation also cannot go up. And Svante Arrhenius in 19th century when he measured the uh, absorption spectra of this gas, he said, oh, maybe that these gases may function like this. And then from 80s, I think, it was taken or revitalized this idea and radiative forcing means uh, the effect of this increased concentration of CO2 or methane due to, due to increase of concentration, this radiation back effect, how much is it? You cannot measure it. You cannot test it. So 
really it's not scientific, because science means Galileo Galilei started European science or West science, and he stayed on Pisa, maybe Pisa Tower, and uh, falling down the different subjects, he measured gravity speed. He didn't have clocks. He then, he did it by pulse, <laughs> he measured it, and then he developed uh, sand clocks and so on. So we, we, are, ve we are very advanced, but here we go before Galileo. Before, yes. So it's, so I was speaking about direct effect of vegetation, and even if we accept radiative forcing, point two or one watt from 1750, we cannot measure it. So, and at the end I took from uh, Michal and from Uri some examples. So, Maharashtra, India, I think you were there, Michal? So it's a year, oh, where is the year? Here. So, t could you say me, it was very dry area, and then they decided to restore it, and there was a Hermann Bacher there as a father of this, and they just stopped rainwater by different ways. Yes, this is what I was looking at. So, 19, 1996 <laughs> and 2009. It's a real case. It's not science fiction. And the people go back. So there was exodus from this country, and now people go back. So we don't need science. We need really experience and to uh, appreciate what people were able to do. That they measured also the underground water level, which is the blue line and precipitation. So you see that precipitation increased and underground water level in wells increased. This is Tamera. I think you were there also. So 07 and 011. So it's a very small, uh, I don't know, it's a, how, how big is it, 100 hectares or no, more? Several square kilometers. Three hectares. Huh? Three hectares. Three. Only three hectares. And so it's unbelievable that on such a small areas when you keep water and vegetation. But it's all, it is 140, 140, yeah. So one and a half square kilometers. So and they, they just make, stop water. This is Peter Andrews, man who in Australia did miracle with yeah. the drained landscape, but then he fall in the depth and so on, because, but because of science. Yes. And you need, it's a high salinity soil. And he also stopped water, and he was happy when weeds came and when fragmites and such a plants, because they make soil very fast. And it's all. I am from the Trebon region, from South Bohemia, where people 500 years ago, 600 years ago, made such uh, artificial fish ponds, which are more extensive than you showed from China, but similar principle. So it's all, thank you for your attention.